thank you all for joining us today here in Northern Nevada. My name is Christine Johnson and I'm the Executive Director of Sparks Heritage Museum. I'd like to welcome you here today for our uh, digital lecture series. And we're really excited to have uh, this really interesting, unique talk today with guest speaker, Casey Menser uh, with the City of Sparks. Thank you for joining us again. If you haven't been to the Sparks Heritage Museum lately, please consider stopping by in the coming months. We're in the process right now of changing out a few exhibits and we're gonna have some really exciting new exhibits coming up shortly and some fun events. And if you're not currently a member, think about becoming a member. You can download the membership form on our website and your membership gives you back instantly some great rewards because we are now partnered with a lot of area restaurants and all of that information is on our website and you get discounts in the restaurants just for, for being a supporter of the Sparks Heritage Museum. So thank you so much for joining us and I'm going to introduce our guest speaker now. We have today Casey Menser and he's the process engineer at the Truckee Meadows Water Reclamation Facility, the largest wastewater treatment facility in the Northern Nevada area. He holds a bachelor's degree in chem chemical engineering, a master's of public administration from the University of Nevada, Reno, and is a registered professional chemical engineer in the state of Nevada. He holds a grade four wastewater treatment plant operator certi certification and is the current president of the Nevada Water Environment Association. He's here with us today to share some amazing images and information. And without further ado, I'll turn it over to you, Casey. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. I'm, I'm very uh, grateful that I was um, allowed this opportunity to present for the Sparks Museum. And um, I uh, I'm really excited to talk to all of you today about the history of wastewater treatment in the in the Truckee Meadows. So uh, as Christine said, I work for the Truckee Meadows Water Reclamation Facility. For those of you who may not be familiar with uh, our, our facility or our mission, uh, basically we treat the majority of the wastewater that comes into the Reno um, and, uh, and Sparks regions. We treat about approximately 30 million gallons per day of wastewater. And that's really anything that comes down the drain, anything that has uh, been, you know, touched by humans um, that, you know, can, uh, contains pollution that we need to remediate um, and, and clean and remove those pollutants before they can be safely discharged back into the environment. And so that's our, our whole goal here. And most, most people, I think, when whenever they uh, look at things that go down the drain, it's kind of out of sight, out of mind. People don't really know what happens after the fact. You know, it just it goes down the drain, it's out of the house, and then, you know, magic happens. Um, but this used to be a, a really significant problem for, for uh, uh, many, many cities as they began to, to develop and as uh, people began to uh, urbanize and, and densify in certain locations, then you had concentrated uh, discharges of, of wastewater. When people would have wastewater, you know, the discharges would go into rivers and streams and, and lakes and everything, and natural processes would kind of remediate that. But as people began to densify, then those concentrated uh, you know, polluted streams became really problematic and nature just couldn't keep up. So I'm here to talk about how that whole problem really came to a head and then evolved for our region. For those of you that are, that are history buffs, you might know this a bit uh, better than I, but I just wanted to kind of put our um, starting point at really the, the, the beginning of when uh, the region began to change and, and settlement and that urbanization um, for the Reno Sparks region began. So in 1844, we had the very first uh, white settler or white man recorded to see Pyramid Lake, um, which was John Fremont on one of his uh, various expeditions westward. Um, he actually named Pyramid Lake and he named the Truckee River the Salmon Trout River, uh, which uh, you know obviously didn't stick. Um, a few months later, we had uh, one of the immigrant parties traveling this region and they were navigated uh, up the river this way by a Paiute named Truckee. And they decided to name the river uh, in, in his honor because of his help. And that is where the Truckee River has gotten its namesake from. So it took, you know, six, seven, um, eight more years before we actually had the first, the very first permanent settlement in this region. And that was uh, by H.H. Jameson. And he established his, his uh, very first, um, you know, permanent uh, uh, trading outfit right by uh, the confluence of Steamboat Creek and Truckee River, which is where our plant is currently located and where I'm speaking to you from now. Um, 
the, the exact location, maybe it's a little bit more debated now. That's why I put an asterisk uh, there. But the 1852 time frame is really that that turning point for when established, you know, established settlement um, in the Truckee Meadows, you know, uh, really, really changed how the region was going to be developing and, 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 and is really that uh, that turning point for everything. So in the late um, 1850s and 1860s, we started to divert Truckee River water, and that's when we started to really manipulate how the natural environment was going and how the Truckee was, was managed. Um, in the 1860s, we had a really big logging settlement that uh, got established up in Truckee River, and they just sent all their sawdust down down. Um, you know, downstream. And that was super problematic. I mean, it, it just mucked up the Truckee uh, an immense amount. And so Nevada passed uh, the Nevada Territorial Legislature. So even before we were a state, they actually banned discharges of any kind of offensive man uh, matter from uh, sawmills, but also slaughterhouses and breweries and tanneries from entering the Truckee River. The only problem is that the logging industries were actually in California. So our ban didn't really make much of a difference. Looking at the, the history of pollution and control. Um, so the Nevada uh, uh, Territorial Legislature, they also banned trout fishing um, during spawning season on the waterway in 1864. And this was really the first act that was really considerate of the fish and trying to protect the native species that we have in the Truckee. Um, and then uh, very soon after that, we actually had the very first sewer lines built in the city of Reno, and they emptied directly into the Truckee River, which most of the time wasn't really that big of a deal. Um, but in the late summer seasons, kind of early fall, uh, when the river flows would really kind of dry up dramatically, you would have just all of this uh, discharge from the city of Reno that was just hanging out in the river, waiting for the, the fall rains to come and wash it away. So it it actually began to be noted as a really big public nuisance. You know, I mean, it smelled terrible. I mean, it was really, um, you know, mal malodorous for, for all the people that were in the, the, the region. Some other really important fa things that happened right around the same time, uh, you had the ore ditch, which uh, was was completed at this, at this time. So that was another water diversion off of the Truckee. And every time that they started diverting water away from the Truckee to, to do irrigation, to do um, other things, it, it started changing how uh, like the fish would actually be able to travel and spawn. So, uh, in 1874, the logging had just continued and continued and continued. And so then Reno petitioned California again to please prohibit all of the sawdust from entering the Truckee River. And it got to the point where the mouth of Pyramid Lake had actually gotten so gummed up with all that sawdust that there was no influence of the lake at all. But the Truckee was just uh, overflowing into uh, Winnemucca Lake. And so I thought that was just an amazing amount of sawdust. And then we, we can see down here, uh, 1875 to 1890, our population in Washoe County just, just doubled. And so we were really at this point, um, and, and we would see it in, in the number of years that followed where our population was doubling at really rapid rates. Um, this photo that I have here is actually uh, in our training facility here. Uh, it's about the plant location, but it's looking westward. This mountain that you can see in the foreground is the is a Rattlesnake Mountain. And then we have Slide Mountain and Mount Rose right behind it. And that is the Central Pacific Railroad. Again, in 1877, uh, Nevada petitioned California to prohibit sawdust dumping on the Truckee. Fish, fish spawning was becoming heavily impacted. The, you know, the harvesting of, of, of fish was, was becoming much more challenging. People were noting that the fish weren't, you know, as healthy, they weren't as plentiful, they weren't as big. So they were really trying to push California, um, which is interesting. It's probably the only time that I've seen where Nevada has been trying to uh, push California to have stricter environment regulations. We had another diversion of water from the Truckee in 1880, um, and that was to feed the Highland Reservoir, which became the town's uh, drinking water uh, plant. And so it was, it was really just a, it was an unfiltered kind of sedimentation only drinking water supply. And it was fed by these open channels. And one of the problems with that was that uh, you'd have like cows or other kind of grazing um, animals that would go into the channels and then fall and then die. And then you have these, you know, festering, uh, you know, carcasses that would be in the drinking water supply for the whole city. And just the whole thing was not uh, not a testament to modern engineering. They had really poor um, screens on their uh, on their municipal supply lines as well. And so fish would often enter 
the drinking water lines that were being fed out to the city and the fish would enter. And then as the pipes would get smaller and smaller and smaller, the fish would get stuck and then they would die. And so the residents referred to what was coming out of their taps as Reno chowder, quite the issue that they had. Um, and it took only four years um, after they had established, you know, Highland Reservoir as their drinking water uh, uh, source that area, like the majority of all areas in Reno were completely cut off due to how many fish were inside of the pipes. In 1887, there were engineers that came out of San Francisco. So we had begun, we, we, we I think as a region had begun to try to investigate our impact on the Truckee River. So we had hired a, a, an engineering firm from San Francisco and Basically, what they said was that all of the uh, wastewater discharges from all the houses, all of the sewer systems should be connected together and then discharged directly into the Truckee. And they stated that it should not noti noticeably impact the water quality. Really, the thought here was that, you know, the fish would eat the big stuff. Going off of this engineering advice, though, in 1889, all Reno houses uh, decided that or they, they were required to connect to the sewer pipes to do exactly that, to, to make one unified uh, collection system, right, for all of these houses and businesses and everything, and to then discharge them directly into the Truckee River. Um, fun fact, a lot of those were built by convict labor. Um, but yeah, that, that was really the, the beginning of this unified sewer system. Now, when we talk about sewer pipes, there's two different kinds of sewer pipes. There is uh, the sanitary sewer, which is all of like the, like the actual genuine sewage um, that comes from uh, homes and businesses. But then there's also the storm sewers. And those are like the storm drains that you see in your, uh, like on the roadways and everything. Uh, what Reno did was that they combined those into a combined uh, storm sewer system which is really problematic because that's a lot of additional water. The storm water that comes off of roads and everything is typically rainwater or uh, you know, from people watering lawns or any of that, that doesn't really need to get that additional treatment. Um, and so when you combine the two, it kind of just dilutes it and it makes it harder to, to, to treat ultimately. By 1895, there were tons of public health issues in, in the city of Reno um, and, and Sparks where you had every, every summertime uh, that, that uh, you know, every summer that would come around, you had all these municipal customers that were using the, the drinking water, the tap water. Um, they, they got frequent fevers, everyone was getting sick. So they sent uh, samples out to California labs and they found all these harmful organisms. And, and when you talk about wastewater organisms, those are like coliforms that cause cholera, uh, giardia, cryptosporidium. Those are the kinds of uh, microorganisms or pathogenic organisms that cause um, that concern to human health. And so they had to issue all these boil water orders and it was just, it was not a good place to be for the quality of water from the Truckee River. In 1899, you had one of the worst polluters um, of, of this early age of industrialization in the region, which was the Florist and Pulp and Paper Company. They established uh, several miles north of Bird Eye. So that's what the plant looks like. And this was a huge deal. Everyone was super excited because it was it was this big employer and everything. I mean, and this so this uh, this article here is from the Nevada State Journal, where you can see, uh, you know, Florist and Paper Mill, 200 men are employed, you know, big deal. But what I really thought was interesting about this is, you know, the Truckee will be harnessed. So they had done more diversions, but then they had also started just discharging their um, their wasted process streams directly into the Truckee River, which was 150,000 gallons every day of this acidic, uh, you know, pulpy uh, processed wastewater. So by about 1903, everything had just become so horrible, um, the management of pollution on the Truckee River, that the Truckee was noted as being a blend between black and brown with soapy bubbles. And all those soapy bubbles are these industrial surfactants and everything that get in there. And it was uh, incredibly malodorous. I mean, people didn't want to go uh, across the bridges or hang out, you know, on, on the river walk, the really nice river walk that we have now, you know, I mean, those would not have been any ideal places. And so you would all, uh, a huge amount of uh, public outcry. And so then they started going to their, their, their council meetings and, and demanding that some kind of water pollution control um, measures be implemented. Another important thing that happened right around the turn of the century was uh, a lawsuit started in 1913. And this was between the uh, US Reclamation Service um, and the and most of the Truckee River, River uh, right users. And that's because people started doing weird things with the Truckee upstream, uh, building dams and having all these other diversions. And it impacted the people down lower on the stream that needed this water for irrigation. 
And that lawsuit, they thought it was going to be a rather congenial thing, just hash out some administrative water rights and everything. Nope, it, it lasted until 1944 before they could actually um, delineate what water rights take precedence and, and who could um, you know, get what amount of water and when. Looking at a more specific city-specific uh, history. So here we have the Sparks wastewater history. Um, and that really started in the late 1800s, early 1900s with the construction of the very first sewers in Sparks. So that's what I have here, this big map. Um, it's from 1911. It's the, the um, collection system that they had created. So this is Prater Way that you can see here. I, I annotated it on the drawing too. This is Pyramid. Uh, Pyramid Highway. And then just for a point of reference, I put in Spark City Hall. So you have, you know, Robert Mitchell Elementary School, Sparks High School up here. Um, this is Lincoln Park Elementary. So uh, all of these collection lines, uh, they converged together. They went to a small septic tank and then discharged directly into the Truckee River that you can see right there. Um, I thought this was an interesting article. They found that once they had installed all of these sewers, uh, that the the papers at the time had to caution Sparks residents not to put things such as dead cats down the drain, just showing that they their lack of awareness of, of what sewers are and people's, I think, mindset that once I just throw it away, it's gone and it's not a problem anymore. Because of all this public outcry, they built the very first wastewater treatment plant in Sparks in 1930, and it was supposed to handle uh, 1.5 million gallons per day. That's what the MGD stands for. So that was the original flow. Uh, it was designed by, by uh, Kennedy engineers. And within 10 years, 10 to 15 years, it was already, uh, they were receiving flows that were about double what it was actually rated for, double the capacity. So then in the 1950s, the mid 1950s, they expanded it to 4 million gallons per day um, for about 300, uh, a little over $350,000. But um, they still did not keep up with the pace of growth in the, in the valley because then by the 1960s, you know, five to 10 years later, they were already exceeding plant flows of, um, you know, getting 4.2 to, you know, peaks of 5 million gallons per day in the summer. So um, it, was, it was really problematic. They had this, uh, you know, uh, growth estimates and then they'd, they'd, you know, build trying to assume, you know, for assumed growth and then growth would just... Uh, explode much, much faster than any, any engineering estimates. One thing that they had an issue with is that, uh, like I mentioned, the, that combined storm uh, sanitary sewer system, uh, you get a lot of that rainwater in, and so that's what causes a lot of these peak flows. So what they did is they tried to separate the collection systems, so that way you'd only have storm drains and sanitary sewers. And that actually dropped the flow, the per capita flow, so uh, the flow per household from uh, 330 gallons today to about 250 gallons per day um, per, per household. However, that's really high because most other cities are about 150. And that's about our planning estimate that we use today is between 150 and 175 gallons per day per um, residential unit. So here's a photo of the original Sparks wastewater treatment plant. Um, it's, it's the one here on the left and that's in 1955. So that's the one that's uh, rated for about uh, four MGD, four million gallons per day. Um, this is US 40 in the background, which then became I-80. You can see it now um, on the right. So we have the Sparks Marina, which is just uh, north of I-80. And then um, the, this parcel here was the original location. And this actually still is linked with, uh, with, with water and the Truckee, um, not in the same way, but uh, the Sparks Marina actually gets um, a lot of inflow from, from groundwater, uh, it gets 3 million gallons per day of inflow. And so there's a pump station at the marina that pumps it across to this facility where it can then um, route it over to the Truckee. Now, Reno was a very similar picture. They were just a little bit bigger in scope. So they built their plant in the same year, 1930, and it was rated for 8 million gallons per day. Uh, but just like with the city of Sparks, they were already you know, out of capacity essentially by the time they turned it on. And so by 1950, they expanded it, they doubled the capacity to 16 and a half million gallons per day. But you know, within the next decade, the flows were averaging right around the, the, the peak um, design uh, flow for the plant you know, between, between 15 and 23 million gallons per day. And their peak flows were actually exceeding 30 million gallons per day. So those would be like the big wet weather events, big storm events, you know, they come and they just, 
you know, knock out the whole plants and, and the plants are really overburdened and they, and they can't, they can't deal with that. In evaluating this, when they were looking at expanding the plant again, um, an engineer named John A. Uh, Carollo, um, whose engineering firm still exists, recommended just, just, you got to build a new plant. You guys can't do this. You guys can't continue to expand. You, you need to do something that's, uh, uh, you know, that's, that's a bit better and, um, and bigger in, in terms of scope. So they also did uh, to try to help with those surges, those big wet weather events and those peak, you know, 30 MGD uh, flows. They started working on the collection system uh, to lower their, their uh, residential unit flows, which were actually even higher. Those were about 460 gallons a day. And by separating those, those two, the storm and the, the sanitary sewer system, they got them down to about 350 gallons per day. But these are some fun photos from uh, 1962, you know, dilemma for Reno, sewer system in Reno has hazardous history. Um, it, was, it was talked about all the time, like all these newspaper articles from, from the 30s, the 40s, the 50s. I mean, it was, it was front page news because of how big of a public nuisance it was. So here's the original Reno wastewater treatment plant. Um, you can see the Trekkie River here. Um, and then it's actually easier to see kind of where this is geographically on the right hand side with where it is today. So we see the Trekkie River. Um, this is the parking lot to the Grand Sierra Resort. So here is the like the entrance into the bowling center and fun quest here. The Aqua Golf is, is, is uh, you know, just to the left of this photo and then the, the hotels up here. Um, down here, this is the Glendale, uh, the Tum Wa, that's the Trekkie Meadows Water Authority, the drinking water. Um, this is the drinking water uh, Glendale uh, treatment plant. So yeah, this is the city of uh, city of Reno wastewater treatment plant about mid 1950s as, as as well. Both plants, when you look at them, uh, this is not the easy the easiest to expand. Um, you know, you have roads and other sort of site constraints. Same thing with the city of Sparks plant. You know, it's it's backed up against a you know a highway and then railroad tracks, so they they can't really continue to expand. So they had talked about regionalizing and just building just build one plant, treat all the wastewater. It's the only thing that makes sense. It's the only thing that's cost effective and economical too for uh, for the for the taxpayers. So um, and this was talked about since the mid 1940s. Uh, the first person to recommend it was uh, Henry Jenks who's actually, his engineering firm is uh, still around and doing work in the water and wastewater industry. Um, they recommended a regional plant that was advocated by Brown and Caldwell engineers, again, still around today, and um, really pushed forward by the Reno city manager at the time, whose name was, was Thomas Hilberg. He was an, uh, a really uh, fervent advocate of this regionalization approach. Um, and then it kept getting pushed you know, uh, throughout the 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 um, the next couple of years and, and decade in 1957, 59, 1960s, this is a photo of what that metropolitan sewer district would look like. That regionalized approach. It would be one um, overall wastewater utility that would encompass both cities and be one plant. And that was from a Kennedy Engineers report. So by the 1960s, something had to give, right? They needed to they needed to expand their plants, but they 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 really couldn't. Reno and Sparks were landlocked and not in a position to do this. So they talked about how they could um, they could both build new plants or they could create one treatment plant that was either, you know, this is the Reno plant and Sparks pays Reno or vice versa, or even Washoe County owns the plant and then both cities pay the county. Or Reno and Sparks could just settle their differences and build one plant together. And that's why every year that you see that goes by here, um, no regionalization had taken place because both cities just had a incredible amount of infighting and bickering like between the city councils themselves and as well as between the two cities you know they didn't trust each other they didn't think that losing control would be a good idea they wanted to maintain everything themselves so that's why regionalization never happened then along came wallace white so he was the director of nevada state health um uh, of the, the State Health Department's Bureau of Environmental Health. And he came down like a hammer on Reno and Sparks. He was not impressed at all. And he'd been involved um, throughout the 1950s and like all this planning and these expansions and everything. And um, by the 1960s, he, he just decided he had had enough of this. And so in 61, he told both plants that they had to have a, a higher standard of treatment. So they needed to remove 90% of the incoming solids by uh, 1980 and the 96% of solids by 2000. That was not reasonable for either plant. They were both so overburdened with flow that it was it was just not going to happen. And then they couldn't do it with the existing technology they had um, or the footprint. Sparks determined that they, yep, we're going to pull the plug. We're going to make a new plant, and Reno's going to make it with us, and we're going to go our go our own way, because um, they were only moving removing about sixty percent of the the solids that were available. And then I saw this. This is from the Reno Evening Gazette. They actually noted that um, 
So they were removing 60% of the solids on good days. A lot of times it was about 30%. Um, but there was a study that also revealed that at times the sewage coming into the plant was less polluted than the same sewage after it was treated, which is just like this amazingly poor uh, treatment that, that Sparks was being able to provide. And the reason that happens is when you get these high flows, um, as you remove solids in your treatment plant, you know, they tend to get um, stored up in your different reactors. And when you have really high flows, what I'm imagining was happening was that the flows would come in and then they would sweep out, they would hydraulically flush out the whole plant. And then you'd have these crazy um, discharges where it was more polluted going out of the plant than coming in. Um, Reno was in the same boat too. So um, one of the things that really spurred this for Sparks was that in June, Wallace White said that you need to build or, you know, build a plant, figure your stuff out, or we will not allow any new sewer connections. And so you basically just can't have development. Um, that was on the front page of the Gazette, of the Reno Evening Gazette in, in June. The, all of the trade unions, the builders unions and everything, they were like, boy, like this is not going to be good. And they're racing for shutdowns and layoffs. And then in August, it actually happened. So that's the sewage problem brings verdict. That headline here, uh, they said that they will not approve any new connections. And so development just stopped for Sparks. Then it went back to regionalization, trying to figure out like, okay, well, let's do this cost effectively. We need to do it together. Um, and, and this was such a crazy politically turbulent time. So there was a, an assembly bill that got sent to the Nevada legislature on creating this metropolitan sewer district. And it failed. Uh, Washoe County came out in opposition of it. Sparks came out in opposition of it. They were just not into it at all. So that's this left-hand column. This is when the, the assembly bill failed. So the regional, you know, regionalized approach was off. But, you know, suddenly in June, it was on again, you know, right when they start having, you know, being told that they're going to have no development. Um, and so then they were considering the merger and then let alone, you know, another month goes by and then, you know, Sparks shuns Reno, a new sewer proposal. You know, it's not going to happen. Uh, they're going to go it alone. And then one month later, you know, Reno City Councilman agrees to consider joint plan. It's back on the table. So it was on again, off again, on again, off again. You know, are they going to build the plant? Um, and they finally do. So 1963, they figure their stuff out um, and decide to co um, collaborate and, and build the Truckee Meadows Water Reclamation Facility that, that I'm currently at in 1964. Um, it took two years to build. Um, this is a, a photo from our actual site. This is the land that, that it was developed on. And they decided that what they were going to do is that it was going to be jointly owned by Sparks and Reno, where the operations were going to be managed by Sparks. So Sparks manages all of the people. And the operational budget, the day-to-day, -day, the chemicals, the, you know, the equipment repairs, all that stuff. Um, so I'm an employee of the city of Sparks. And the capital projects are, would be managed by the city of Reno. So Reno does like the big expansions, like with all the engineering and the, and the bidding and the, the management of uh, construction contracts. So that's all the city of Reno. Currently, we serve uh, a whole host of, you know, Washoe County parcels as well. And we serve all of uh, Sun Valley. So Sun Valley uh, General Improvement. Uh, district actually um, uh, leases capacity from the city of Sparks. So our tributary area, and I have a map of this um, uh, coming up, but it goes uh, north of Holcomb Ranch Road uh, to south of Golden Valley, all of Spanish Springs, all of Sun Valley, like I said. So it's it's a really, it's, it's really quite um, uh, an amazing footprint that we have um, and, and region that we service. So while all this is going on, um, there's a couple other like big environmental things that then begin to change what the treatment plant has to do and the water quality that has to be produced. Um, so just kind of sidestepping the plant history for a second. Um, one thing I wanted to point out is that in the 1940s, um, there was actually the extinction of a particular fish. This is a um, subspecies of the Lahontan cutthroat trout. Um, it's the Pyramid Lake cutthroat trout. It was actually, uh, um, the bigger of the species. And so it's, it's biggest uh, catch was four feet long, over 40 pounds. And then by the 1940s, it was uh, completely extinct, which is unfortunate. But luckily, because of environmental regulations that were coming out, like the Endangered Species Act, uh, the, the kiwi fish was listed as endangered. Um, shortly thereafter, you have the creation of the Environmental Protection Agency by the Nixon administration. Um, and the very next year, the Lahontan cutthroat trout was also listed as endangered, which is, which is I mean, great that there's this recognition that the water quality and, and the, you know, the diversion of, of irrigation ditches and um, like the industry influence on the Truckee had had this notable impact on the fish and we could get them protected. Uh, 1972 came out with the Clean Water Act, and that really dictated a lot of these water quality 
um, standards that the treatment plants would need to make. Because before they just would remove um, solids and what's what's known as a BOD, that stands for biological oxygen demand, which is really just the, the strength of wastewater. 1975 comes around with the Clean Water Act. We actually had to start really focusing on, on nutrient removal at our facility. Um, one of the one of the most uh, the, the first one that we decided to focus on was phosphorus. Now, um, phosphorus and nitrogen are really important uh, nutrients in the natural environment, and they're really impactful from wastewater treatment plants because, um, you know, as humans, you know, consume things and everything, uh, you know, we we uh, pass through a lot of nutrients that if they're not dealt with, they enter the waterways and they contribute to the process known as eutrophication, which is, you know, the greening of water, it causes the algae blooms. Um, and when algae bloom because of this, this nutrient rich environment, they suck up all of the oxygen out of the water and they create dead zones where, you know, fish will swim through them, they don't have oxygen and then they die. So, it, it, and, and some of them, you know, they can create some, some of these uh, 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 toxins and everything. So phosphorus was the one that we decided to go with first. And the EPA actually uh, uh, issued us a grant and our plant here um, in Reno Sparks was the very first one to uh, do a full scale piloting of this phosphorus stripping or faux strip technology to remove phosphorus. And we were the very first plant in the world to actually implement that technology. So really cutting edge. Um, also by the time 75 happened, Lahontan cutthroat trout was uh, reclassified. So it was no longer endangered. Uh, it got bumped up to threatened, which was great. Um, and then 78, we started to have some of our first expansions. The original plant was 20 MGD, where 10 of it was uh, 10 million gallons was owned uh, by the city of Sparks and 10 million gallons was owned by the city of Reno. Um, so 78 was our very first expansion from 20 to 30. We had another one in the mid eighties from 30 to 40 million gallons per day. And then we also added uh, nitrogen removal technology. So this is the mid eighties is when um, we were able to tackle the nitrogen problem too, which was just in time because by uh, 1986, uh, Pyramid Lake was having these, these really um, big algae blooms. Uh, this photo here, I should mention that this is the Lahontan cutthroat trout, um, the one back here, that's the Pweebee fish. So in terms of other, you know, Truckee River pollution, something that was found um, was uh, a big petroleum leak. And so uh, the Nevada Division of Environmental Protection, or NDEP, they, they were notified of a groundwater contamination at the uh, Santa Fe Pacific Pipeline Petroleum Storage Facility. So uh, if you guys have driven 80, I-80, right, that's a big white tank farm on the, um, on the south side of the road there. Um, this was owned by Shell at the time. Shell said that, you know, in their investigation, they probably seeped out, you know, a million gallons of, uh, of hydrocarbons, those being like a diesel fuel or gasoline into the groundwater. But the investigation from NDEP, they actually suspected that it was at least 4 million gallons and perhaps as high as 40 million gallons of uh, hydrocarbon fuel. So this, this was a huge deal um, for, for the region. And so we had, there was actually a congressional hearing on this. That's where the, this photo on the bottom right comes from, this uh, hydrocarbon map. You can see the Interstate 80 is here. Um, you have the tank farm. And then this is the plume that they were monitoring with their groundwater um, research to show like where the plume had been traveling. And this was actually identified at Helm's Pit. That's where this came from because it, it, you know, Helm's Pit was pumping out all the water so that they could have a dry quarry and do all of their aggregate, aggregate mining and everything. And so with all that pumping, they pulled the plume that way. So a lawsuit was filed, uh, remediation began in 1995. And since then, um, remediation is, is, is ongoing, although there's, there's, the, the hydrocarbons aren't really um, there anymore at all, which is great. They, they, they focus on other trace chemicals, but um, since uh, that almost 30 years of pumping, they've pumped about 6.8 billion gallons of groundwater and remediated it, which I think is really great. Uh, 1994 was a really big game changer for the river and for the plant. Uh, there, were, there was the creation of what are known as TMDLs. Those are total maximum daily loads um, established for the Truckee River. So those are based off of um, water quality standards of the receiving waters. And those water quality standards are um, like the level of treatment that you have to provide. It, 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 it depends on the kind of waterway that you're discharging into, right? If you discharge into the ocean, I mean, it's immediately diluted. And so pretty much anyone on the California coast like doesn't really care about nutrients or much of anything, right? Whereas us, I mean, we, uh, the Truckee was designated as a cold water fishery, which means that they're a lot more sensitive to, to changes in nutrient loading and it needs to be preserved. And so we actually have the highest uh, standard for, wa for water quality standards. 
And so they said that the Truckee River from your plant, from the Truckee Meadows Water Reclamation Facility, can only assimilate 500 pounds per day of nitrogen, 120,000 pounds of dissolved solids. Those are things like salt, like chloride, sodium, you know, those, those things. Um, and then 134 pounds of phosphorus. So the reason why this is really impactful for our facility is that it's a total mass, you know, that goes in. So it's 500 pounds. And that, that doesn't matter on how much flow we receive. So, you know, if we start, you know, 1994, we have this amount of flow plus this amount of nitrogen, right? That equals 500 pounds of nitrogen per day. However, if we have double the flow, we have to have half the amount of nitrogen to still maintain the same pound loading. So as we get more and more flow into our facility, our, our limits are staying the same. So our concentrations and our technology have to get um, better and better and better and, and lower. Right about this time, so our, our uh, uh, nitrogen removal uh, processes uh, start with these. These are trickling filters. These guys right here, this uh, this water passes over um, this uh, corrugated plastic media that you see here. Um, and on that media, we grow a biological uh, slime layer and, and, and utilize the work of microorganisms to actually uh, remove nitrogen, uh, particularly in the form of ammonia, um, out of the wastewater. Uh, and in 1994, they discovered these tiny little pouch snails, uh, and they love to eat biomass out of these trickling filters. And so uh, we had these, these crazy issues with nitrogen and trying to manage it. And it became a really big deal for us. Um, I think that we, uh, uh, we were, by 1995, um, like I said, we had 500 pound, uh, pounds per day uh, monthly average that we have to meet for nitrogen. Well, the month of December of 1995, we were over 2000 because of these snails. And so this was, uh, we were doing like, uh, nationwide research. We had the, 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 the best university professors working with us, and we got this grant to do a $1.8 million project to do this sort of uh, uh, predator mitigation um, treatment to kill snails at our towers and preserve the biomass. The only problem is that it doesn't kill snail eggs, and so we do this in perpetuity since 1995, twice a week. But it was, it was, it was a, a really uh, fantastic um, research, uh, you know, experiment, and it and it helped uh, inform the design of future uh, trickling filters like this. Uh, Ninety six is when we actually started uh, to irrigate as well. They built a pipeline from our plant for um, this is our first regional reuse project. They built a pipeline to Don Mello Park, and then our uh, effluent was able to water the grass. Ninety seven, we had a really big flood. Um, this, I mean, anyone that was around here in ninety seven remembers the flood. Um, uh, we, this is a one in a hundred year flood event. And for our facility down here on the bottom right, uh, water came up right to the very lip of our facility. We're not underwater, but we were dang near close. And so they actually had to helicopter and staff. They drove all the operators and the mechanics to the fairgrounds, and then they helicoptered them into the plant to, to manage the flow because we're really, I mean, we're, we're true protectors of the environment and we don't wanna have any crazy, uh, you know, po pollution discharges into the Truckee, you know, and so our facility, which at this time was rated for 40 million gallons per day, took in 90 million gallons per day during the flood, and it did um, over $100,000. I've seen estimates of over, over $500,000 of damage to our facility, um, just to try to manage all of the, the flow and the sediments that came in from the flood. Um, fun fact too, Pyramid Lake rose by five, over five feet, which was 192 billion gallons that got added to um, Pyramid Lake that year. So this brings us up to now. Um, we had one more expansion in 2004 to bring us to our current capacity. Um, our current uh, uh, permitted capacity is 44 million gallons per day. Um, 2015, we have the signing of the Truckee River Operating Agreement. This one just really outlines um, like the, the logistics of where the Truckee River water goes. It's water rights in Nevada are just immensely complicated. Um, and this is probably one of the, uh, the, the more complicated pieces of that. But it, it's important for our facility because the water that comes into us has been diverted from the Truckee, right? Sent to the residents of Reno and Sparks and then is ultimately recollected. Well, that, that Truckee River water has already been promised downstream. So we have obligations to um, send it back to the Truckee River. Um, we can irrigate some, but this kind of outlines, you know, what we can irrigate, how much, what, what water we're um, allowed to do. Uh, 2021, we completed our latest facility plan, which maps uh, you know, out the next, boy, I don't know, 10, 20 years of, of uh, growth in the region and what we're going to do as a facility to deal with it. Um, we have some big reuse projects that are coming up. So for irrigation, um, we're currently collaborating with uh, City of Reno, City of Sparks, uh, Washoe County, and Tumwa on um, looking if we can use 
our effluent to help some of the turf farms that are out there in Palomino Valley. And uh, 2022, uh, you may have seen in the newspapers where we have a pipeline that's being uh, uh, built all the way from our plant out to the uh, Tahoe Reno Industrial Center. So the, you know, like the Gigafactory area, all that. Um, they have a bunch of industrial consumers that want to use like our water for process water instead of, you know, clean Truckee River water because they don't, you know, they don't need it. So I think it's a really great way to kind of reduce, reuse, recycle, which is exciting um, for, for us. Um, a couple of things on how things have changed. Uh, the, the verbiage, I think, surrounding wastewater treatment plants has changed over the years because I think public perception uh, is really impactful for us and for, um, you know, our acceptance into, you know, mainstream discussion. So we originally started as the Reno Sparks, you know, joint sewage treatment plant, right? That doesn't sound very glamorous. So in the 70s, right, with the passing of the Clean Water Act, it became the Water Pollution Control Facility, then, you know, Wastewater Treatment Facility, and now we're, you know, the water reclamation facility. Although in all the literature that I've read, the latest and greatest is a water resource recovery facility because um, we as, as wastewater treatment plants recover a lot of the resources that we use. We produce a biogas um, as, as part of our processes. We actually uh, uh, use to produce electricity. We produce a megawatt of electricity and save taxpayers like a uh, uh, hundred grand a month, you know, with, with our ability to recapture that resource and, um, there's a lot of other really other innovative uh, resource recovery aspects of, of treatment plants nowadays. Here's some fun photos looking back, uh, you know, uh, through uh, through history. So the late 70s, this was our whole control system. Uh, early 90s, you know, this is our little alarm panel. And then now, uh, you know, before we had hardly anything automated. Now everything, I mean, our control logic is, is king here and it's its own animal. It has a life of its own. And now we're, now we're looking at uh, what uh, the... The industry as a whole is looking at machine learning, artificial intelligence, all that stuff. So it's it's come a long way. I thought this was a fun photo. These are our uh, aeration tanks of the photo. This is what does a lot of the uh, organic um, pollutant removal. In the 1970s, I don't think that they thought handrails were that big of a deal. Maybe they're, I, I can kind of faintly see maybe ropes dangling between you know the the two posts and everything. But you would not want to be working out here on a windy day. And you know now obviously we have uh, guardrails and uh, they're they're very much. Uh, you know, not not uh, considering safety as a, you know, as as an aside. So this is just our facility, 1964, uh, an overall footprint of, of what we look like and then what we look like today. In the interest of time, I'm not going to go through all this, but we've had several expansions going from, you know, 20 to 30 to 40 to current capacity and, and these different um, expansions that we've done. This is the same thing, just in graphical format. It just, I think it highlights the magnitude of our facility. And you can kind of see as, as each of these different years and regulations, you know, 78, phosphorus removal, you know, 85, nitrogen removal, 2004, you know, expansion. Um, you know, you can kind of see how the growth has happened um, incrementally throughout the years, especially with permit requirements. So the plant today is very advanced. Um, we're a tertiary treatment plant, which means we have three main processes. We have a physical removal of stuff. So we use screens or gravity settling. Um, that's the primary part of the process. Then we have biological treatment. This is where we uh, concentrate microorganisms to actually consume all of the organic uh, junk that comes into us in the, in, in the wastewater. Um, as well as we, we in our particular configuration here remove phosphorus at this point. Then we have two separate stages to remove nitrogen, um, and that's our tertiary advanced nutrient removal um, process. And then that's uh, finished up with, with polishing. We filter it, we remove a lot of the turbidity and colloidal material, and then we disinfect the water to remove pathogenic organisms um, that, you know, like coliforms or E. coli. Um, and then all of those organics um, and, and, um, and solids that we remove, they get thickened, they get digested, they get processed. Um, in a way where they become uh, more stabilized. And then we take the water out of them and we send all of those solids to the landfill. And then we have some uh, nutrient recovery aspects for our facility as well. We really constitute the, lar the, the lion's share of wastewater treatment in the Valley. We're a 30 million gallon per day treatment plant right now. Um, don't, don't blame me for this map. This was created by the TMRPA. I didn't choose the, choose, choose the colors, but um, we take all the purple, the orange, the red, and then this blue, and then all these kind of associated county parcels. All of this comes to us, but we have a couple other smaller plants. We have the Lemon Valley plant, 20,000 gallons per day. That's this parcel here. The Cold Springs plant, which is obviously the Cold Springs hydrographic basin. Uh, Reno Stead is about almost 2 million gallons. They're expanding right now. That's this parcel. And then the South, the Stum Wharf plant, that's the South Truckee Meadows Water Relation Facility. 
Uh, they're not associated with us. We're the only one owned by Reno and Sparks. Um, they take about almost 4 million gallons a day. And that's like Double Diamond, Demonte Ranch, Arrow Creek, that whole neck of the woods. This is our effluent system. In the interest of time, I won't, you know, tear into some of these other, um, you know, uh, uh, points here. But our, our effluent system, we feed a number of uh, public parks and like golf courses and some like aggregate mining for dust control and everything. Um, we extend all the way down to Miraloma Park. We go all the way uh, north. Here is uh, Vista. Um, we go all the way up through Kylie, uh, Kylie Ranch um, and then up Pyramid and all the way out to uh, Martin Marietta Gravel Pit. So that's the extent of our um, reuse system. Uh, Tell more today. So it, it's, we've come a long way. Uh, we now have 64 employees. We have 27 operations uh, uh, staff members. They work 24 seven, always here, always around the clock, making sure that everything is always running um, at peak performance. We have 17 maintenance, that's mechanical and electrical. We have a fully stocked lab of certified chemists to do all of the water quality analysis every single day. Um, our, our chemists work seven days a week. Um, we have nine admin. We have four environmental control officers. Those are our sewer cops. They make sure that people aren't discharging things that they are not supposed to. Um, our current uh, operational budget is about $25 million a year. 30% is people. 9% uh, of that's power. We spend about uh, 200 grand a month in power. Um, but we actually, because we do resource recovery, um, we produce about a third of our own power. So we save almost $100,000 um, a, a month. Um, and then chemicals are 18% uh, of that. Chemicals are expensive. And uh, our capital improvement budget, every year we have an annual investment between 10 and $15 million to keep the facility running and to keep the Truckee River clean and beautiful. Um, and I just want to touch base, like there's a couple challenges too for us as a facility, um, and, and it makes it really interesting to try to make sure that we always maintain really good water quality. We can only be shut down for several hours. You know, like things don't stop flowing our direction. Um, and so we can be shut down for about four hours before we would start, um, you know, having manholes kind of blow out in the streets. So with us, we have to, whenever we do work um, at our facility, it's, it's, it's essentially working on the car while it's driving, right? You can't shut it off. You have to, mit you, you know, mitigate um, things in different ways and manage projects. It's really complicated. Um, you know, there's always more, you know, you know more projects than there are uh, funding. And there's, what's great about wastewater is that there's always new technologies, which is really really great. Um, but because we have such a stringent permit, um, anything that we do requires vetting. I think with that, uh, and this, this down here, this is actually inside of one of those uh, trickling filters that I showed you earlier where the snails live. This is a rehabilitation project that we completed in uh, 2020. So with that, I'm happy to answer any and all questions. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much for this lecture, Casey. This is incredible. And I actually think we should all thank you for the work that you do. Uh, we do have some questions. Uh, and some comments, uh, let's see, um, from our one of our city councilmen here in Sparks. Uh, it's, he says he, uh, it looks like both cities opened their sewer plants in 1930. Do you know which of the cities, Reno or Sparks, opened theirs first? So uh, finding some of those records was a little challenging. Um, I, from what I can deduce, I believe it was the city of Reno plant. Don't quote me on that, but I believe that the city of Reno plant um, did open and start construction on their plant first comment. Uh, it seems that bad businesses and overpopulation definitely contributed to the problem. I've noticed that I can't make people care, and this includes students, but how can they be taught that their lack of concern will cost them greatly in the future? That's an interesting question. Yeah, and you know, we've, we've I think, really tried to do a lot of, of public outreach because we see that too, where uh, anytime we give tours at our facility, um, and if you want a tour, feel free to email me, um, and we can always arrange something, but... Um, Love tour. Yeah, um, we've we tried to do a lot of public outreach because most people, they just send stuff down the drain. They don't care at all and they don't really care about the environmental impacts and stuff. So we've we've actually been really proactive in reaching out to a lot of the um, middle school and high school um, uh, like environmental science classes and, 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 and a lot of their students to try to open their eyes. And they, we do something now called Snapshot Day where they go and they, uh, they do Truckee River water quality sampling every day. Um, uh, Reed High School is really big. Um, we, we see them every year. We see Galena High School. So I think that we've just been trying to do a lot of public outreach. We actually created a virtual tour of our facility too um, to try to show these and that's available online. Um, so if you go to the City of Sparks YouTube page, you can find a tour of our, of our, our facility. And we try to do those kinds of things to Remind people, you know, that we're here, we exist for a reason, and it's important, but I, I agree. Yeah. 
Um, another question, are there goals to reuse effluent in more areas? Do communities in our, of our size reuse effluent or are we unique? Yeah, so there are definitely, I think, goals to expand uh, reuse. So when we have, you know, a 500 pound per day limit of, of you know, of nitrogen we can put into the Truckee River, um, if we find more reuse sites, that's ultimately flow that doesn't go to the Truckee, so it doesn't kind of count against our, our uh, uh, total mass daily um, limits that we have. Um, but uh, there's there's the an investigation right now to go all the way out to Palomino Farms, but I know that there's uh, there's a lot of regional things where we look at what what we could do. I mean, Washoe Golf Course would be really excellent, but that you know is tearing up a lot of roadways, kind of in the middle of town. Um, but I know that there are some other big reuse projects that they've been talking about. We try anytime that there's you know new subdivisions to include reuse water. So like the Kylie Ranch. Um, development that's being built out right now. I mean, that's all um, irrigated, reclaimed water. Uh, we're not super unique. Um, one thing that we, one thing that they're doing in, in Reno Stead though, is that they're doing kind of this feasibility study of producing really, really high quality effluent um, and then doing um, uh, ground water injection, which I think is um, more unique. It's the first project like that in Nevada, certainly, and one of uh, only a, a dozen or so in the, in the United States. Since you've separated sanitary sewer from storm drain water, is the storm drain water treated? Uh, so they, they do have, um, and I'm, I'm not an expert in, in storm water, um, and that's a, our utility division with, within the city, um, but I, they do have uh, different things, like they have sand oil separators, that way like oil that gets on the roads and then gets washed into the, into the storm drains, you know, those can be treated. Um, so I know that they do have some kind of uh, separation where they can kind of remove sediment, solids, oils, those kinds of things, but uh, another question, is it better to wash your car in the driveway or go to the car wash? That is an excellent question. I would say car wash because a lot of the drains that they have there come to the come to our uh, to our sewers because um, in that way any of the like the the, um, the chemicals you use to treat them or to, to, to clean your cars and everything all of those you know get treated by us ultimately rather than the storm drains which go into like the, the North Truckee drain and then into the Truckee. Another question, um, you, you showed some photographs of the 1997 flood um, and mentioned the damage to your facility. Have any uh, proactive efforts been made to uh, mitigate a future flood if such a flood should ever happen? They've done a lot of work on the North Truckee drain for flood mitigation. So that's been a big part of it. Um, it it's, our plant has focused on wet weather uh, management strategies. And so we do have a lot of sort of internal protocols now where, you know, at the, you know, at this flow rate, you know, you kick on this process or you open the valve to fill, you know, this kind of, um, you know, uh, this, this tank with this much water. So we, I think we've come a long way having had some of these historic floods now under our belt. Um, and that was prior to our expansion. And so we've been cognizant of that as we've sized equipment and, and, and done all of that. Um, but I think a lot of the work that uh, has been done, especially by our, our utilities division on, on stormwater management has been really helpful. I want to thank you, Casey Menser, for joining us here at the Sparks Heritage Museum for our digital lecture series. And thank everyone for joining us here today for this as well and your wonderful questions. Um, stay connected with the Sparks Heritage Museum. Uh, visit our website at sparksmuseum.org and check out coming events and join us as a member and explore your options for discounts in area restaurants and the support of the Sparks Heritage Museum uh, in general. We rely on admissions and donations and memberships to stay here for you and do wonderful programs like this in the future. So join us, support us, and thank you all today for joining us here. Thank you again, Casey, and see you with the next digital lecture, everyone.